Welcome back. Thank you to John and to Malcolm for moving us and leading us this morning. As we move into our keynote address, Robert, I want to thank you for last night and uh, moving us and uh, stimulating us the way you did. And you're absolutely inspirational. And I know you're leaving uh, mid-afternoon, uh, your flight, so I don't know if I'll have a chance to uh, thank you again, but for your friendship, for your leadership, for your wisdom and your kindness and your grace, uh, you've been, you are a blessing to us. And uh, I hope we'll see you back in the not too distant future. God bless you. Thank you, uh, Peter. I assume this is on and you can hear. So what a, what a blessing we've already experienced in uh, Malcolm Sinclair's extraordinary proclamation this morning. And uh, so my imagination is dancing with images and memories that I will cherish and take home uh, to the red clay of Georgia. Uh, as Peter indicated, uh, the Reverend Dr. Anna Carter Florence and I will be departing with the Atlanta delegation in Toronto, you see. And uh, we've been summoned back by our government. No, no, no. We, uh, <laughs> but we will be departing and I look forward to uh, to returning. In fact, as I said, uh, Peter, the, the food was so good, I'm already regretting that um, I'm going to miss lunch, but uh, I'll be here next year, I'm sure. I, I uh, really appreciate the fellowship and hospitality, the extraordinary uh, uh, gifts that are present in this well-planned, well-executed, and uh, elegantly administered conference. So I want to commend all of the congregations and leaders and pastors and participants once again, and a special appreciation to Malcolm Sinclair and John Joseph and Lynn Holness for their uh, assistance and support on Sunday as I visited the Met uh, congregation. So thank you, friends. Um, I've been impressed by the quality of the printed materials and these wonderful programs and color, the Facebook page that Peter has asked us all to visit and to like, and I will be sure to do that. Uh, it reminded me that not all congregations have wonderfully printed programs, and often there are people who do not adequately uh, proofread their work. Uh, you all have heard these uh, bulletin announcements actually printed in church bulletins, and I can't uh, resist from sharing a couple as we begin this morning. You've seen these. Don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> or the low self-esteem support group will meet Friday evening at 8 p.m. Please use the rear door in the basement. <laughs> or the Weight Watchers will meet Wednesday night at the First Presbyterian Church. Please use the large double doors on the side. <laughs> and then my favorite, the eighth grade youth group will present Shakespeare's Hamlet on Saturday afternoon. We invite the entire church to come and witness this tragedy. So. <laughs> the preacher as public intellectual. In the great and consequential events of life and history, ideas matter. Some people are called to serve the public good through the production and presentation of ideas. Most who do this are academic, campus-based scholars and professors who are employed to undertake research, teach, translate, disseminate, and apply knowledge. Many of you are here today. These are commonly known as intellectuals. But some people engage the larger public with ideas that promote ethical visions and moral perspectives on our common life. They aim to solve human problems, especially large persistent issues such as exploitation, inequality, injustice, and hyper-individualism. And there are others whom the Italian political theorist Antonio Gramsci referred to as organic intellectuals, who live and work amongst the people and highlight ideas that advance their interests. Building on that insight, I, I would submit that Christian preachers 
are, certainly can be, public organic intellectuals who seek to announce God's good news to humanity and vividly present new, attractive moral possibilities for creation's future, both human and non-human, as depicted in Genesis. In this presentation, I'd like to suggest that Christian preachers have and can contribute important ideas and proposals for creation's flourishing that challenge, expand, deepen, and enrich secular modes of reasoning about the human condition. I begin with a working definition of the public intellectual, and I illustrate this point of view with examples from preachers who were public intellectuals, Reinhold Niebuhr and Martin Luther King Jr., among others. I have two goals in this talk. Number one, to celebrate and highlight the preacher as one who contributes publicly to the grand and eternal questions of human existence, and who does so from the vantage point of the church, a community that gathers around a specific but inclusive set of claims about ultimacy. All important issues of the day must receive the insight of the Christian pastor and preacher alongside the information and perspective of the natural sciences, social sciences, other humanities, and other representatives of differing faith traditions. So to celebrate the role of preacher as public intellectual, contributing to this larger conversation about the large things that matter, seated alongside scientists, hum uh, humanists, and others. And second, encourage to encourage you to be more intentional about joining and leading, when appropriate, the public conversation about the well-lived life, the good community, the just society, faith, values, and our ethical responsibilities. And so I maintain that public intellectuals think and communicate ideas strategically to calibrate the moral compass of the nation and to catalyze constructive action. So that's the mission or the call. Now that's what I think, but what do others think about who public intellectuals are and what they do? In an influential essay titled The Responsibility of Intellectuals, America's preeminent public intellectual, Noam Chomsky, said the following. Intellectuals are in a position to expose the lies of government, to analyze actions according to their causes and motives and often hidden intentions. They have the power that comes from political liberty, access to information, and freedom of expression. But what about the Canadian context? Nelson Wiseman, editor of a wonderful set of essays titled The Public Intellectual in Canada, this is a wonderful little book published by the University of Toronto Press in 2013, Nelson Wiseman, The Public Intellectual in Canada. He says, and I quote, unlike American, British, and French public intellectuals who usually take for granted the worth of their work and the sturdy cultural foundations of their societies, Canada's public intellectuals have had to negotiate the shoals of Canadian identity as they have striven to reconfigure it, end quote. He notes the great receptivity of can can Canadians to public intellectuals, especially Francophone Quebecers, compared with the English-speaking Canadians, Wiseman's perspective. Then, and he says, and I quote, as an independent critic, the public intellectual is a free ranger who offers a breadth of vision that transcends any one particular branch of a science, art, or vocation. As such, he, and I would say she, is much more than a scholar in a single field or a professional specialist. The public intellectual taps and channels the critical, contemplative, and creative sides of the audience's minds. 
I find that sentence especially suggestive for my thesis. The public intellectual taps and channels the critical, contemplative, and creative sides of his audience's minds. I believe that we need preachers and pastors to become more intentional as local leaders who think in public, who think and communicate from the pulpit, particularly in light of two trends. One, high rates of biblical illiteracy in our cultures, and two, a growing culture of anti-intellectualism and mistrust of science, reason, and data. Writing in a 2014 issue of Christianity Today, Ed Stetzer reports, and I quote, Pew Research tells us that 23% of Americans didn't read a single book in the last year. Is it just only 23%? That's three times the number who didn't read a book in 1978. Now, whether it's the internet, video games, the TV, or increased time spent on entertainment and sports, Americans are spending less time between the pages of any book, not just the Bible, end quote. Another study by LifeWay Research found that only 45% of those who regularly attend church, 45% read the Bible more than once a week. Over 40% of the people attending are reading their Bibles occasionally, once or twice a month. So 45%, less than half, reading the Bible more than once a week. 40% maybe once or twice a month. In, in fact, 18% of attenders say they never read the Bible. It's extraordinary to get that kind of candor for 18%. No, we never touch it. It's, it's dangerous. If this is true, that means there are millions of North Americans who lack meaningful awareness and knowledge of religious ideas. The historical importance of the Bible as a decisive force in generating Western civilization and its salience as a masterpiece of literature and language. With respect to anti-intellectualism, Janice Gross Stein, who is a Canadian public intellectual and fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, notes the following. The dumbing down of public discussion in contemporary democratic societies. She says, and I quote, without a well-informed citizenry, vigorously debating the future, our democratic institutions atrophy becoming the preserve of a political class and privileged elites. Our public space empties out, and private interest replaces public concerns and a shared sense of a common future and the collective good." End quote. Now, together with what Pew and other researchers have reported in recent years about decline in many, not all, mainline Protestant Catholic and evangelical traditions, then we should realize that there may be an opportunity lurking here for preachers to inhabit the vacuum. Back to Nelson Wiseman. He says, I quote, the public intellectual taps and channels the critical, contemplative, and creative sides of her or his audience's minds. Further, Janice Gross Stein says, the intellectual is someone who plays with abstract ideas for the sheer fun of it. Like jugglers, intellectuals initially have no ulterior motive other than to play with concepts and abstractions for the pleasure that it gives. Like artists who are driven to make art, even when no one appreciates what they create, Intellectuals may have no instrumental purpose other than to enjoy and enhance the elegance of ideas. Intellectuals are creatures of both reason and passion. That sounds a little like Aristotle, doesn't it? And the two are inseparable, end quote. So I hope this notion that intellectuals are passionate thinkers resonates with many of you. 
I want to interweave with these understandings of public intellectualism the role and opportunities of the prophet and the preacher. As I do so, I'm introducing a counter-narrative about what preachers should be thinking and talking about. From the Hebrew prophets to the early Christian preachers, their priority was to pay careful attention to the immediate zitzim leben, or situation in life. They were shepherds called to attend to local knowledge, local experience, local practices. They talked often about mundane things, but as they did so, they connected the local to the larger, grander themes of God's profound concern for all of creation and all of God's children. Perhaps the bumper sticker puts it aptly, think globally, act locally. That does get close to capturing my point, although my preferred bumper sticker reads, Jesus is coming soon, look busy. <laughs> the interplay and dialectic between the grand and the mundane that, prob that probably sounds like the story of your daily lives. Recall how Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote about this viewpoint of the prophet. His opening book, I mentioned to my workshop yesterday, I hope all of you have on your shelves, Abraham Joshua Heschel's little book, The Prophets. The opening sentence of the book, Heschel writes, what manner of man, I would make this inclusive, man and woman, is the prophet? A student of philosophy who turns from the discourses of the great metaphysicians to the orations of the prophets may feel as if he were going from the realm of the sublime to an area of trivialities. Instead of dealing with the timeless issues of being and becoming, of matter and form, of definitions and demonstrations, He's thrown into orations about widows and orphans, about the corruption of judges and the affairs of the marketplace. Instead of showing us the way through the mansions of the mind, the prophets take us to the slums. The world is a proud place, full of beauty, but the prophets are scandalized and rave as if the whole world were a slum. They make much ado about paltry things, lavishing excessive language upon trifling subjects, end quote. That's the opening paragraph of Heschel's The Prophets. You'll see how that notion, that insight from Heschel works as a counter-narrative to what I want to develop. Public intellectuals are dealing with grand questions. Heschel's, ah, au contraire, Mr. Franklin. They deal with trivialities and they transform and recontextualize those trivialities into larger grand themes. So let's shift now from the identity and vocation of the public intellectual to the tasks, practices, and teachable arts. And here I would ask Peter, that first slide. Stated directly, public intellectuals and prophets address the grand questions of human existence and ultimate concern by providing compelling responses to those grand questions directed to the public at large in short form with the goal of catalyzing strategic action. There are at least five dimensions of the work I wish to highlight. Addressing the grand questions of human existence and ultimate concern. Public intellectuals can start with parochial issues and recontextualize them into the larger moral drama that invites everyone's interest. We heard it yesterday with Andrew's sermon. We heard it this morning in Malcolm's sermon. Dr. King also did this as he took the issue of desegregating buses in Montgomery, Alabama after Rosa Parks deliberate and defiant moral agency in transgressing segregation laws, and he placed that, um, what could be more local? Bus seating, fair seating on a local bus in some unknown city in Alabama. 
But King took that and placed it into a larger drama of good and evil are on the great stage, and we are a part of that drama. They address the grand questions of human existence. Second, they provide compelling responses to those grand questions. Public intellectuals, the preachers in this audience, they do not seek to answer those large questions. What conceit? I am here to answer your deep and, and persistent questions. No, no. As if such questions could be settled finally. Rather, they seek to offer responses. We heard some of this in Dr. Anna Robbins' address yesterday. How do we respond to these challenging questions, Welchmerz and Ennui? The New Testament scholar Gail O'Day said that as we engage the questions raised in the wisdom literature, for instance, as I tried to, to, to engage last night, why do the good die young? Why do bad things happen to good people? My God, why have you forsaken me? There are people in our congregations every Sunday sitting there with those questions, and they come with that large bowl, Malcolm, hoping you will drop something into it. And if we preach about some of the things I often hear preached about on Sundays, and those are the questions they bring, they will go home and trade that big bowl for a small plastic cup. We do not offer answers. Rather, as Gail O'Day says, there is no answer to such questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? She says, no answer, but there is a reply. No answer, but a reply. And the reply is restated throughout the Hebrew Bible, throughout the New Testament, and that reply is simply, as you go through this crisis, you are not alone. You are not alone. Yahweh declares, I will be with you. For so many people, that, those sentences, those words, that is the good news that can make all the difference between life and death. You don't have to answer those questions, but offer the reply, God is with you. Third, they address the public at large. Who is the audience of the public intellectual, the audience of the Christian preacher? Not simply their own tribe, and in this respect there's some tension here. For pastors who feel called to preach only to the members of this particular congregation, I'm suggesting you, what, the treasure you have do not contain in earth and bed. Move out. Move into the streets. Take it to Young Street. Someone out there is, 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 is hungry and searching. They address the public at large. As David Tracy, the great system theologian, they address all rational people, not simply their own tribe. Public intellectuals speak to the people, the whole people the unformed but possible community that comes from identifying common ground. They resist the temptation to sing only the familiar hymns to and with their familiar friends. They seek to deparochialize every text by asking how we can be radically inclusive. John Bell, in his ministry with us these days, has deparochialized our sense of the hymns we sing. We recognize those tunes, but there are new words there that, as Dale Rose says, prompt us to pay, lean in now in a new way. If we sing the familiar hymns with familiar words, familiar tunes, we can almost ignore them. We do that on autopilot. But when you, as Gene Lowry says in this wonderful book, The Homiletical Plot, when you upset the equilibrium, when you insert new lyrics into familiar songs and music, Ah, people have to pay attention. Perhaps this is a device we should utilize more often in our congregations. People are bored. They don't like the hymns you've selected. Well, upset their equilibrium. Familiar music, new words. And they communicate, number four, in short form. Now this one I take is subjective and perhaps controversial. But I'm thinking of, for instance, you know, a short sermon, something I don't often preach, and I'm, <laughs> I've been blessed by Dr. Anna Carter Florence and others who are preaching concise and powerful messages. I am a student. I must learn to do this better. 
But I'm also thinking of the op-ed, the preacher who writes a piece and she publishes it in the local or community newspaper as a way of thinking in public and demonstrating to others that pastors, preachers are also part of the larger public conversation. Concise radio commentaries and brief sermons that seem to be the most adequate genre for our age. Shakespeare told us that brevity is the soul of wit. In our concision lays our salvation. Get to the point, please. Have something to say. Say it well. Say it briefly. Drop the mic and close the sermon. Slam shut, as, as Rita Nakashima Brock says. At the end, slam the door shut. This seems especially well suited for our attention deficit audiences. Twitter, media culture, and even heads of state who are suspicious of extended coherent sentences. <laughs> Finally, they seek to catalyze strategic ethical action. So all of that grand questions offering compelling responses, not answers, directed to the public at large, not just your tribe, in short form, not the long extended discourse, essay, or book with the goal of catalyzing strategic ethical action. One of the deans of homiletics, Henry Mitchell, says that every sermon should invite or prescribe or include a behavioral response. So go back and look at your sermon manuscript. Is there a behavioral response hinted at or explicitly prescribed or offered? How can people respond. You've made a call. What is the response? And it's often useful and empowering to suggest two or three or four ways, and not just ways that uh, the young, healthy activists in the congregation, what about the elders? How might they respond? They're not coming to the march. Or what about those who are physically challenged or disabled? How do they participate? In other words, a menu of responses that brings everyone into the possibility, response, to the call. Now, in light of these criteria and insights offered by Heschel on the prophets and Janice Stein Gross on the public intellectual, consider these two exemplars who have been powerful for me. I'm working on a book now on moral leadership, and so some of these fragments are, are gathered up, and I'm so grateful that I've had this opportunity, Peter and Will and Malcolm, thank you for this invitation, because now Canada will figure into my manuscript more largely than it would have, and so uh, I'm going to credit you guys for this, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. So, uh, Peter, the first slide. The ethicist and Niebuhr biographer, Reinhold Ras uh, Larry Rasmussen, begins his book by observing the following. When Harvard University sought a keynote speaker for its 350th anniversary celebration in 1986, an occasion which called for a public intellectual with a commanding presence who could speak across the disciplines, American literature professor Alan Heimert told President Bach that only two people in the last 20 years could have made that speech, Walter Lippmann and Reinhold Niebuhr and they were both gone. He continues, Reinhold Niebuhr was a dramatist. I love the way Anna Carter Florence is working with the sense of drama uh, and, and play. And he says, Niebuhr was a dramatist of theological ideas in the public arena. And with the exception of Martin Luther King Jr., commanded more influence than any other 20th century theologian and preacher in the United States. Again, this is Larry Rasmussen in his biography of Niebuhr. He was remarkably, and he continues, a public theologian in a nation not much given to theological reflection on its considerable power in the world, nor generative of intellectuals as common fixtures of public life. Niebuhr was a public intellectual and enjoyed it, an activist scholar held in high regard in his culture, who nonetheless cultivated a, sense, a stance of sharp, independent criticism. 
He was, in fact, a prophet heard in the king's chapel and in the king's court, chastising the certitudes of a confident culture and exposing its fault lines with rhetorical power and the sheer force of his personality. If recognized as a prophetic voice and a public intellectual, Niebuhr demurred from theologian as the proper title for the trade he plied, end quote. Now, Carl Paul Reinhold Niebuhr, his full name, was born in 1892 in Missouri, the son of a German evangelical synod pastor, Gustav. He declared his wish, young Carl Paul Reinhold Niebuhr, his wish to become a minister in 1906, early teens. He was instructed in Greek by his father, Gustav. Niebuhr recalled of his father, I quote, I was thrilled by his sermons and regarded him as the most interesting man in town. Oh, I wish I could get my teenager to say that about me. <laughs> After Eden Seminary and Yale Divinity School, where he wrote a thesis in 1914 titled The Validity and Certainty of Religious Knowledge, end quote, he began a 13-year tenure as pastor of Bethel Evangelical Church in Detroit, Milton. There, he kept a diary that formed the basis of the wonderful little book titled Leaves from the Notebook of a Tamed Cynic. Many of you know that book. For those of you who do not, Again, I recommend this one for your shelf. Reinhold Niebuhr's Leaves from the Notebook of a Tamed Cynic. He wrote this book, by the way, in 19, published 1929. This is after his pastorate, so he could be candid about his experience. Although Niebuhr became the most powerful public intellectual and Christian preacher of his time, he did not start there. He grew. He evolved, and that offers hope for all of us. Rasmussen writes, the play of Niebuhr's mind was most evident when he preached. The play of his mind. Recall, recall Janice Gross Steins, the intellectuals, the juggler of ideas, enjoying the sheer elegance and beauty of ideas. Here, Niebuhr, the dramatist of theological ideas for public life, was perhaps most at home. His sermons were usually given with a few spare notes, or none at all. Some were reworked for publication as sermonic essays. And in the first year of his ministry in Detroit, he wrote, and this is from the leaves from the notebook of a tamed uh, cynic, and I quote, there is something ludicrous about a callow young fool like myself standing up to preach a sermon to these good folks. I talk wisely about life and know little about life's problems. I tell them of the need of sacrifice, although most of them could tell me something about what they, that really means. Another entry. Now that I have preached about a dozen sermons, I find I am repeating myself. This is Rhino Niebuhr. A different text simply means a different pretext for saying the same thing over and over again. The few ideas that I had worked into sermons at the seminary have all been used. And now what? End quote. Oh, I love the candor of Niebuhr here early in his ministry. Then in words that are amusingly prophetic, in light of his subsequent extraordinary influence, he writes, and I quote, I suppose that as the years go by, life and experience will prompt some new ideas, and I will find some in the Bible that I have missed so far. You're supposed to stand before a congregation brimming over with a great message. Here I am trying to find a new little message each Sunday. If I really had great convictions, I suppose they would struggle for birth each week. As the matter stands, I struggle to find an idea worth presenting. And I almost dread the approach of a new Sabbath. I don't know whether I can ever accustom myself 
to the task of bringing light and inspiration in regularly, regular weekly installments. How can you reconcile the inevitability of Sunday and its task with the moods and caprices of the soul? The prophet speaks only when he is inspired. The parish preacher must speak whether he is inspired or not. I wonder whether it is possible to live on a high enough plane to do that without sinning against the Holy Spirit." End quote. Niebuhr left that parish in 1928 when was appointed Dodge Professor in Applied Christianity at Union Theological Seminary in 1930. In 1939, he delivered the Gifford Lectures at Edinburgh. Even as Nazi bomb was bomb, Nazi was, Nazis were bombing the city, one evening he's delivering a lecture. They had to pause as the lights were rattled. The building was shaken by bombing. War and suffering transformed and radicalized his theology and preaching. During those years, he spoke of human pride, of creating peace by balancing power between superpowers, and the many expressions of arrogance that offend God's creative intent, such as nuclear weapons, racism, genocide, sexism, and so on. Ten years later, by virtue of his writings and sermons, he was asked by the U.S. State Department to advise the government on policy in Europe. Ironically, this dangerous pro prophet was also being monitored by the FBI. Niebuhr wrote long, complicated books, classics like Moral Man and Immoral Society and The Nature and Destiny of Man. And he admitted that his brother Helmut Richard, or H.R. Niebuhr, his brother was a better writer and a clearer thinker. But in his sermons, back to Larry Rasmussen's point, and his articles in magazines like Christianity and Crisis and other publications, Niebuhr arrested the attention of the wider public. He got the attention of Young Street. His sermons were published under the title, if you want to enjoy a devotional season in your life, get his book of sermons titled Beyond Tragedy. In the end, in 1964, as his health was waning, Niebuhr received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And his serenity prayer may very well be the best symbol of public theology in user-friendly form. You know this prayer. It almost sounds, John, like something out of the Iona community. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. That was Niebuhr's prayer. It was often attributed to people in the medieval period. It was Reinhold Niebuhr's words. Niebuhr's little prayer was embraced by Alcoholics Anonymous in 1941 and has touched and helped millions of people. Niebuhr was a public intellectual who dressed the grand topics of human existence. The public address, he, ad, he addressed these que grand questions with providing compelling response, directed to the public at large, in short form at times, with the goal of catalyzing strategic action. In fact, he did this so well, his own government became suspicious of him. Some of the things we do in the name of our Lord and for the gospel may arouse the attention of business and the state. He struggled to find his voice as a young preacher, as you heard, and pastor. But as his diary indicates, world events drove him, compelled him to notice the impact of those events on the lives of the ordinary people at Bethel Church. He commented on local things like the marketing and cost of a new Ford automobile there in Detroit, an impact that had negative impacts on his parishioners. But he pivoted to link that to the corrosive effects of capitalism, larger economic forces that drove humans to place material things above human dignity and worth. This could be called the prophetic pivot. And now, Peter, this next time. Martin Luther King, you know his biography. You know his sermons. No need to rehearse that. But his prophetic pivot 
if you will, occurred early in the, his pastoral ministry also. And it wasn't altogether voluntary. When Rosa Parks engaged in civil disobedience on that segregated bus in Montgomery, King, at, recall at the time, 1955, King was a brand new pastor. He'd just been installed. Not only that, he was a newlywed. He just married Coretta months early. Not only that, he was also a new father. And he was working on his dissertation, Peter. So he's writing every chance he gets in the church study. He did not want to disturb his equilibrium. But when he showed up for one of the mass meetings that day when Rosa Parks was arrested, he sat there, they say, back near the middle of the church. He didn't want to be noticed. And someone called him up and said, we need a new person, a new voice to articulate this drama. Well, King was honored and exhilarated, but also terrified. He ran home and quickly prepared notes for the evening meeting. That first sermon was nothing short of a masterpiece of linking the local situation to a larger moral drama. And I urge you to go back and look at that first sermon. He wrote, or he said that night at Holt Street Baptist Church in 1955, we are here in a specific sense because of the bus situation in Montgomery. We are here because we are determined to get the situation corrected. This situation is not at all new. The problem has existed over endless years. For many years now, Negroes in Montgomery and so many other areas have been inflicted with the paralysis of crippling fear on buses in our community. On so many occasions, Negroes have been intimidated and humiliated and oppressed because of the sheer fact that they were Negroes. I don't have time this evening to go into the history of these numerous cases. Many of them are now lost in the thick fog of oblivion. But at least one stands before us now with glaring dimensions. You can almost hear Heschel's echo that prophets speak of widows and orphans and the isolated vulnerable individuals who need a voice in the courts of power. The people on Young Street who need a voice, your voice. I quote him at length here as I move toward my conclusion. Just the other day, just last Thursday to be exact, one of the finest citizens of Montgomery, not, no, not one of the finest Negro citizens, but one of the finest citizens in Montgomery was taken from a bus and carried to jail and arrested because she refused to give up her seat to a white person. Now the press would have us believe that she refused to leave a reserved section for Negroes, but I want you to know this evening that there is no reserved section. The law has never been clarified at that point. And you know, my friends, there comes a time when people get tired of being trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. There comes a time, my friends, when people get tired of being plunged across the abyss of humiliation, when they experience the bleakness of nagging despair. There comes a time when people get tired of being pushed out of the glittering sunlight of life's July and left standing amid the piercing chill of an alpine November. There comes a time, by then the, 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 the audience is just almost hysterical in response. And as we stand and sit here this evening, and as we prepare ourselves for what lies ahead, let us go out with the grim and bold determination that we are going to stick together. We are going to work together right here in Montgomery. And when the history books are written in the future. Somebody will ha have to say there lived a race of people, a black people, fleecy locks and black compl complexion, a people who had the moral courage to stand up for their rights, and thereby they injected new meaning into the veins of history and civilization. And we're going to do that. God grant that we will do it before it's too late. As we proceed with our program, let us think on these things, end quote. Well, here you see King being local 
and placing this struggle over fair seating on a bus into a moral drama that historians could record. And although his 1963 speech, I Have a Dream, and his Been to the Mountains top speech in 1968, the night before he was assassinated, they're better known, I, I, I celebrate this very first speech from this young 26-year-old pastor. Later, he sat in jail and wrote the letter from Birmingham jail, and I commend that to you also as an extraordinary example of public intellectualism. Janice Gross Stein says the intellectual is someone who plays with abstract ideas for the sheer fun of it. Like jugglers, intellectuals initially have no ulterior motor, no motive other than to play with concepts and abstractions for the pleasure it gives. Like artists who are driven to make art, even when no one appreciates what they create, intellectuals may have no instrumental purpose other than to enjoy and enhance the elegance of ideas. Intellectuals are creatures of both reason and passion, and they are inseparable. King was doing more than enjoying the elegance of ideas, but he did insist that there be an aesthetic dimension to his public discourse, and you can see the poetry of his language. I think that preachers as public intellectuals should at least consider whether or not King and Niebuhr represent models of inspiration that may help us as we go forward. So think of it, we have a 23-year-old pastor, Reinhold Niebuhr, at the, at the beginning, a 26-year-old Martin Luther King at the beginning of his public ministry, struggling with the audacious, audacious task of saying something important about the immediate issues of their listeners and their parishioners, but also about the moral hygiene of the nation. They grew into public intellectuals and followers of Jesus who helped to recalibrate the moral compass of the nation. In that final slide, Preachers, storytellers, poets, and artists understand the pliability and improvisational use of language, and they also know how, or they take risks learning how, to frame good news in ways that reach the unreached. Anna Carter Florence is, 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 is a genius at helping preachers do this. I now conclude with a tribute from a voice, there are really two voices, but time, I will simply share a few words from one. A week ago, Peter Holmes contacted Anna and me and reminded us, alerted us to the death of Gord Downey, arguably another Canadian public intellectual. Oh, Downey's words, music is the ultimate medium for the expression of love, and those expressions find a beautiful backdrop in the environment. Music is also a popular rallying point. At its central core, it's a way to get people in touch with the best parts of themselves and to voice the love in their hearts. And the environment is one of the great loves of our lives. I grew up on a lake and spent most of that time outdoors. As a musician, I travel widely around the country and talk to a lot of people from all walks of life. That experience, combined with my rock and roll roots, gives me something of an affinity for the underdog. In many ways, the environment is also the underdog. And so it's an easy fit. I stand in support of the Athabasca Chippewaan First Nations and all Canadians who find themselves with no voice in our present version of democracy who are trying to come up with the entry fee that gets them a seat at the table where their pollution future is being discussed. And then in a wonderful observation that captures that sense of language as play, he says, Gord Downey, a great song's greatest attribute is how it hints at more. He says his group, Tragically Hip, has always had a strong curiosity to see what's around the next corner, to see what more we can do and what more we can say to each other, primarily. We try and serve the song. If we're any good at it, 
that it's because we're together on that. And in a compelling tribute to Downey, Damien Abraham of another group said that tragically hip songs, and I quote, are stitched, stitched into the collective subconscious of this country in a way that can come only from being played constantly on radio, television, and during breaks at play of sports events. And that after deeper listening, he says, I was blown away by Gord's ability to tell stories and convey emotion within the constraints of the song, end quote. We heard on National Public Radio last week as tributes were being played to Downey, that Prime Minister Trudeau tweeted, and I quote, Downey is a true original who has been writing Canada's soundtrack for more than 30 years, end quote. And so as we mourn Gord, let's also mourn another brilliant poet who left this veil just a few days ago. It's extraordinary, these two great poets. Some of you know his work, Richard Wilbur, who was Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. If you don't know it, simply Google, because I don't have time to read. His poem, particularly poignant in light of Heschel and King and Niebuhr and what I'm suggesting in this lecture, his, his, his uh, poem is titled, Advice to a Prophet. Advice to a Prophet. I'll read only the first uh, stanza. When you come, as you must, to the streets of our city, mad-eyed from, from stating the obvious, not proclaiming our fall, but begging us in God's name to have self-pity, Spare us all the word of the weapons, their force and range, the long numbers that rocket the mind. Our slow, unreckoning hearts will be left behind, unable to fear what is too strange. He goes on in it, just breathtaking uh, uh, lyricism. Advice to a prophet. Finally, our culture needs powerful voices and thoughtful minds to recalibrate our moral compass. Remember King, remember Niebuhr, hear the words of these commentators on public intellectuals. Remember the words of the medieval rabbi Maimonides. The world is equally balanced between good and evil, and your next act will tip the scale. Thank you for listening.